webinar series whose name has been initially defined as research doesn't stop. We are getting out of the COVID situation, so we might change the name, but I mean, for the time being, that's the title of our webinar series. Uh, we are very pleased, I'm very pleased, delighted and honored to have today here as a speaker, Professor Amanda Weinstein um, from the uh, University of Akron in Ohio, is it correct? Yeah? That's right. Uh, Amanda is Assistant Professor uh, of Economics over there. Uh, and um, a research focus is on fields that are very, very close to uh, the research tracks and the research domains of the social science area of the Grand Social Science Institute. And actually, uh, she actually researched on the determinants of urban and regional economic issues. Uh, she has a special focus on, on women in the economy, which, which is uh, also an issue here at the GSSI. And, and on, on this topic, I've checked, she has a terrific uh, 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 portfolio of publications uh, and, and, and top journals where, which are quite familiar to us, well, to me at least, the Small Business Economics Journal of Regional Sciences. These are journals that we know, we know very much, and just let you mention a few. Um, so having said that, we are again uh, very pleased to have her here and we look forward to hear from her presentation. Uh, before doing that, um, let me briefly remind you which are the rules of the game. Uh, we're going to leave a speaker uh, at most one hour time, so if you finish before it's, it's, it's fine, but you have say one hour time. To, to make your presentation. Uh, during this hour, if uh, there are short spotlight questions, I will be able to take it. I will be happy to take it in the Q&A bottom. Uh, otherwise, as usual, uh, we're gonna have a proper and extended discussion uh, at the end uh, of uh, Amanda's presentation. Uh, again, let me remind you that we are uh, recording uh, the webinar. So if someone uh, does not want to be recorded, uh, there's a solution. He or she can join uh, the presentation on our YouTube channel where we are broadcasting the webinar and, and, and that will be that will be solved. Okay. Uh, having said that, I want to steal further time to Amanda. Amanda, I leave you the virtual floor and please uh, uh, start your presentation. Thank you, Sandro. Thank you for having me here today. So this is a presentation where I've kind of mashed two of my uh, papers together, one recently published in the Journal of Regional Science about gender differences in quality of life and preferences for amenities. And the other is a working paper I have about uh, using an aggregate approach, approach to estimating quality of life. So kind of related, uh, but really largely, it's about thinking about economic development uh, in a different way. All right, so hopefully everybody can see my screen now. It looks like you can. Perfect. All right, so I'm gonna take you, you're gonna be kind of welcomed into my life and into my home here today, uh, virtually. Uh, so I am in Ohio, in the Midwest, in the United States. And in Ohio, like many states, um, probably I would guess maybe in Italy too, when we think about economic development, we typically think about tax breaks and tax abatements. And this is what the way to grow our economy. So this is a billboard in New York City paid for by Jobs Ohio, an economic development organization in Ohio, basically touting to people in New York City that, hey, yes, your buildings are taller, but our corporate income tax rate is smaller. So you should join us in Ohio. Now, what this billboard ignores is that the obvious fact is that there are so many businesses who have chosen to locate in New York City, even though the tax rates are higher. And so what you have is an economic development organization that is ignoring those factors. Why are businesses and people locating in a place that has higher tax rates? It has to be something else, some other factor. So if you look at how Ohio measures up, yes, we have low corporate income tax revenues. 
uh, the fifth lowest in the nation of all of the 50 states. We have low corporate taxes. So at the bottom here, you can see, yep, we have low corporate income taxes. But even though we have low corporate income tax rates and don't generate much money from it, we're the 37th in the nation in terms of job growth, right? So clearly there's something else, a bigger factor than just tax rates that are going on when it comes to economic development in this state. So the organization that paid for this billboard uh, does economic development policy for the state of Ohio. And this is their stated mission. Uh, so they're actually an arm of the state. Uh, so they've done some kind of legal things to call themselves a private nonprofit, but they're funded through uh, basically uh, liquor taxes. Uh, and so really what the goal is, is to try and get businesses to locate in Ohio or to expand their businesses with Ohio to attract, retain expansion efforts. And typically it's through these type of fiscal incentives. It's through tax breaks, tax abatements. And if you look at their website, they will give you a list of eligible pro uh, projects and ineligible projects. These are their words. So on the left hand side, you can see all of the industries that they will consider giving money to, giving tax breaks to. On the right hand side are all of the industries that they will not give tax breaks to, will not give money to. So on the left hand side, you see advanced manufacturing, aerospace aviation, Ohio has a history of manufacturing. And so in part, they're trying to build on this history, but in part, they're trying to save what Ohio has lost by outsourcing, by globalization, by trying to bring manufacturing back. And on the right, if we look at these ineligible projects, right, really we can see like this is the government picking who they think the winners will be in the economy and who they think really the losers are, who they want to spend government money in and who they don't. And if we focus in on these losers, the ineligible projects, right? If you look at this list and then kind of separately think about where you live, right? So in Laquila, I might be saying this in my horrible American accent, uh, right? And think about what you like about it, right? What do you like about living in the place you live in, right? A lot of us start to think about, you know, the restaurants nearby and we think about local amenities nearby and we think about quality of life types things. For me, right, I think about a lot of these ineligible product, projects, right? I think about what I have available to me in terms of shopping, in terms of restaurant. And yes, I think about the daycare that I appreciate my kids being at more than ever now <laughs> that we've been dealing with a year of this pandemic, right? These are all important things for our economy, but they've just been deemed the losers uh, by this organization. And another one that we don't even see on this list are public goods and services. So they're not investing in public goods and services to help economic development in this state. And so this goes against a whole line of literature about the importance of quality of life. So here's a quote from uh, Consumer City paper uh, by Glazer et al. that says the success of cities hinges more and more on cities' roles as consumption, as centers of consumption, right? So this is where they kind of coin this phrase, the consumer city, right? How important it is for uh, cities to be focusing on the things that make their city nice, private goods and services, restaurants, bars, public goods and services. So that could be parks, good air quality, crime rates, and natural amenities, beaches, mountains. Now from a policy perspective, right, you can kind of knock the natural amenities off the table because you can't build beaches and you can't build mountains, right? You can build on the amenities you do have, right? Parks, trails and that type of thing through public goods and services. But it's really talking about the importance of all of the things that make a place nice. And so this is a recent article that came out from the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy that basically said all of these things that make a place nice are increasingly important in the pandemic. So one thing the pandemic highlighted was the need for outdoor spaces, even in cities, the need for urban parks. And the pandemic has really highlighted all of this kind of social infrastructure, these public goods and services, and these places where we can be outside and be together uh, that we need. Is there someone with the mic on, please? Turn it oh, off. I think that I think that might be Sarah. Sorry, oh, what, what I'm calling you on Sarah. 
oops, there we go. And so if we think about who is making these amenity investment decisions. So if we look at in the US, less than 25% of mayors and state legislators are women. So it's mainly men making these types of decisions on public goods and services. If we think about private goods and services, just over 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. So that is men making decisions on the types of private goods and uh, services that are the amenities we might look for. And so we see a lot of research that women feel vastly underserved by markets. That is kind of an unmet need that we aren't you know, giving women the appropriate level of amenities, private and public goods and services that make that they think make places nice potentially. So when we talk about making places nice, when we talk about quality of life in an area, right? So how do we decide what makes a place nice? So there's a lot of articles that will talk about, hey, here's your top 10 cities in America. Here's the best places to live. And it's usually some journalists sitting down and kind of figuring out, well, what they think is nice. But what we have with markets is we have a way to figure out through revealed preferences that people are making in markets, um, what they think are is nice, what cities they think are nice. Because we know that households are willing to pay higher housing prices and also forego higher wages to live in areas with a high quality of life. So what that means is we can take data. So this is micro level data that we typically use here. So typically it's census data we have for the US to look at individual level data. So that would be your I there uh, to look at house, uh, house prices, that's your R, your rents and wages, your W. So we're looking at two regressions here, one for rents, one for wages. And we're controlling for individual factors. So your X, I, there could be household uh, characteristics, the number of bedrooms, the size of the house, controlling for individual characteristics, your education level, um, you know, your industry, occupation. And then we have this kind of fixed effect. That's your J. So your J would be a fixed effect for that city. Your J is kind of the premium that you are willing to pay to live in a location. So if you talk to real estate agents, right, they will tell you location, 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 right? That is where that J is coming in. So what we're doing is we're getting that fixed effect that people are willing to pay through higher housing prices and lower wages. Uh, this is through Rosen and Robax model that Albu has also um, done a lot of work on um, to get an estimate of which cities people generally think are have a higher quality of life, are a nicer place to live. And then we kind of weight those two fixed effects. Uh, so this is through Al Bowie's work that we get these weighting factors to weight the fixed effects on the housing regression and on the wage regression. To get this Q, an estimate of a city's quality of life, higher Q, higher quality of life, lower Q, lower quality of life. So then once we have this Q, then we can start to figure out, well, what amenities will increase your Q, your quality of life? And so that's where we can pick out natural amenities. So we can look at the estimate of being near a coast, being near a beach, having mountains, having you know nice weather, uh, public goods and services, crime rate, education, air quality are the big ones there, and private goods and services, things like restaurants and bars. And typically in the quality of life literature, it's actually a pretty limited list of amenities that they use. And these are kind of the typical ones that I've listed here. Uh, so actually this is a picture of where I live in Hudson, Ohio. Uh, and so this is our main street. So we have a historic downtown uh, that people love. It's got cute little shops, it's got restaurants, it's got bars. And so when I read the quality of life literature and when I hear people like Ed Glazier and like Richard Florida talk about quality of life and talk about having these cool restaurants and bars, right? I think about my town and why I love my town so much. And so when I think about shopping, as I was reading, so this is as a grad student, as I was reading these papers on quality of life, I was reading them thinking about, oh, this is so exciting. I think about my town. I think about why I like certain cities. And I would get to the end of the paper and I would kind of think something was missing because when I think about shopping in restaurants, this is what comes to my mind. I'm also telling you my TV viewing habits right here. So one of my favorite shows was Sex in the City and you see them going shopping all the time, right? And so when I think about shopping, 
this is the picture that pops into my brain. So every time I would read one of these quality of life papers, I'd be like, Ooh, this is exciting. When are we going to talk about women? And we never did. None of those papers ever talked to women. I would go through those papers. I would do a Google search. I was like, why are we talking about women? It seems like if you want to talk about like cafes and shopping at some point, you should talk about women. So the first time I was putting this presentation together, I was like, well, I don't know, maybe I'm being a little biased here because I am a woman, right? So I Googled like, well, I'll show a picture of men shopping. So I Googled men shopping and this is the first picture that showed up, right? These men aren't shopping, right? The, I, so I think in Italy is a little different than in America. Uh, so I think the Italian men are a little more well-dressed than here, which is lovely when you're over there. But these are men are not shopping, right? Clearly they are waiting for the women they are with who are shopping. And so I was thinking about this and I was like, we should really be talking about women here. And so I wanted to look at, are there differences, right? Are there gender differences in quality of life? Because the quality of life methodology that I just described to you is basically getting an average, right? But averages can mask distinctions, can mask differences between men and women. So the quality of life literature never considered whether men and women's preferences could be different. And if we look to other literature, for example, in the marriage and bargaining literature, we really see it fails to uphold this assumption of common preferences. Men and women don't have similar preferences. Uh, so women tend to allocate more household spending towards women's clothing, also restaurant meals, and goods and services for their children. These are the things that they prefer to spend more money on. And so we can think, well, would women want something different in their cities, right? They might spend money slightly differently than men, but would they want their cities to be different? And if we look through history, in the US, women have voiced differences in opinions about their cities. Uh, so more of my viewing habits here. One of my favorite shows is The Marvelous Ms. Maisel. So at the top picture here, this is Ms. Maisel, uh, fictional character. But this is Ms. Maisel in Washington Square Park in New York. And they have this fictional character go to something that actually did happen in history. When Jane Jacobs, uh, urban planner, went to protest urban planners, Robert Moses, who wanted to take this park down. They wanted to pave it over with the roads. They were putting more of their investments and preferences towards infrastructure like roads and less towards investments in parks like Washington Square Park. So at the bottom left is the real Jane Jacobs. On the right is kind of the Jane Jacobs from Marvelous Ms. Maisel. But what Jane Jacobs wanted to do is really preserve these places of interconnection within cities, places like parks, where women especially were coming with their children, preserving places that connected women to all of the things they do in their daily lives, from childcare, errands, shopping, work, taking a break, taking your kids to a park. And so we see that women have voice differences in opinions of what they want their cities to look like. So, we can also look to literature from experimental economics. So generally economics tends to take kind of this agnostic approach to gender where we might not be focusing as much on where gender differences come from and instead just look at is the outcome different by gender. So in experimental economics, we see a host of experiments that suggest that uh, men and women might be different on things like risk aversion, which might mean they have differences in preferences for crime for the risk associated with poor environmental quality and the health effects. And they also have differences in altruism. So things like caretaking activities, which might lead to differences in preferences for childcare, for example, and lead to differences in things like time use. Uh, so they might prefer, you know, also to spend more time uh, in, you know, spending money you know, on restaurants money instead of, uh, you know, making meals themselves. And so they're kind of supplementing their time here. And so we see some evidence from experimental economics and just from data on time use that men and women are making different decisions and might also make different decisions when it comes to preferences for cities. Still, so if we look at this gender similarities hypothesis, right? So, and this basically reminds us that even though averages might be different, 
for men and women, even if we think about height, right? On average, men are taller than women, but it doesn't mean all men are taller than all women, right? So there's overlap in these distributions. And so there might be a lot of similarities in amenities and they might have similarities in cities and amenities. And if we think about beaches, for example, Coming into this, right, I did not think that it would be men love beaches and women think, oh, beaches are terrible, right? Probably men and women like beaches, probably men and women like mountains, a lot of these natural amenities. But the distinctions we do find might be meaningful and important. So what we do, that quality of life literature, uh, that methodology that I went over, we use that typical methodology the difference we do here is that I, that individual, we separate it out from men and women. So what we do is we take that housing regression and we take that wage regression and we just run them separately from men and women. Now the key is to separate those preferences out, right? Once you get married is where it all gets messy unless you have some type of natural experiment like they did in the marriage and bargaining literature. Here we don't have that. So what we do is we focus on never married and single men and women age 23 to 39, and we do their housing and wage regressions to see if they evaluate the quality of life in cities differently. So here we can see on the left is the top 10 most highly ranked cities for women. Notice that CA there, there's a whole lot of California, right? Beaches. On the right, a whole lot of California, more beaches, we get it. People love beaches, men and women love beaches, I'm sure. And you can kind of see from these top rankings, you see a lot of the same cities pop up, right? Uh, yeah, men and women, their top cities are pretty similar, not exactly the same, but pretty similar. So if we throw all of these, uh, these are large metropolitan areas up on a scatter plot, this dashed line here is the line where the quality of life valuation for men and the quality of life valuation for women is exactly the same. So where you see those dots get farther off the line is where men and women are starting to differ on their valuations of quality of life for that city. And if you kind of squint your eyes a little bit, you see those top cities, cities like Honolulu, Hawaii, those California cities, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, right? They're a little more similar on the top cities. They agree more on the top cities. But if you start to look at those bottom cities, right, that's where there's a little more disagreement going on. And when you look at this, you do see there are a lot of similarities. You see a lot of dots along this line. Men and women have similar valuations for a lot of cities, but not all cities. And there's one big standout, Gadsden, Alabama. So this is in the South in the US. If you look at men's quality of life valuation, they basically think Gadsden is perfectly average. It's a perfectly average city. If you look at women's valuations, so that's that y-axis, it's all the way on the bottom. Gadsden for women is the worst city and it's not close to any other city. We're gonna come back to Gadsden in a little bit. So if we look at this on a map, Right, so one worry you might have is, well, Gadsden's in the South, right? Is it that women just don't like the South? And generally what we see is no, that's not the case. So here, if you look at these black dots are the cities that women prefer more than men. The gray dots are the cities that men prefer more than women. And the size of the dot is the size of how much they differ in their opinion. So the biggest gray dot you see at the bottom right kind of that's Gadsden, Alabama, most preferred by men. But when you look at this map, you see that there are gray and black dots everywhere. You see some spatial patterns. You see a little bit on the West Coast there, there tend to be more black dots. You actually see in the Midwest, there tend to be more black dots, but you see kind of a smattering, right? So it's not that we've created some methodology that just says, well, all women hate the South or something. That's just not the case. There are plenty of cities uh, in the South that, that women like. One of them is uh, Savannah that I've been to, cute city. Um, so we don't see that. Some regional differences, but not an extreme. It's just like, well, women all hate the South. So then what we wanted to do in this paper as well 
is generally the quality of life literature takes these kind of broad amenities. It's usually just a handful of amenities, 10, about 10, 12, 15, something like that amenities. It's not a lot. And so another thing I would look at when I was reading these papers is, man, I want to know so much. I want to know like, well, what about casinos, right? So in America, we have a lot of cities who have said, you know what, we'll help our economy in the city. Let's put in a casino, right? What about casinos? What about stadiums, right? I could just think off the top of my head, and I'll bet you could too, right? If you thought about the amenities in your cities, we could sit here and within five minutes, we could probably come up with a hundred different amenities. And I kind of wanted to do that. So we do have an issue with this. We only have 283 metropolitan areas, large cities in the US, and I can easily think of more than 283 amenities. So what we wanted to do is take this long, long, long list of amenities, put, throw in a ton of natural amenities, throw in a ton of private goods and services, uh, clothing stores, restaurants, fast food, stadiums, museums, lots of public goods and services, and then use a lasso method. This is a least absolute shrinkage and selection operator to basically pare it down. Which amenities can it pick out is having the most uh, kind of significant impact on the quality of life value estimations for men and women and the difference in their evaluations between men and women. And so it's kind of this AI method to pare down all of these amenities. So this is, I'm giving you kind of a little snippet of what uh, some of these amenities that we pulled out. I don't want to show you a table that you can't read and have it be an eye chart. Uh, so basically when it comes to natural amenities, what we kind of expected is that men and women's preferences are nearly identical. They both like beaches. They both like mountains. They both like nice weather. So this is largely uninteresting, but it does present itself with a kind of nice check on this quality of life methodology. We would expect similarities and preferences for beaches. And that's exactly what we find. So I'm gonna move on from here because it's generally kind of uninteresting. Private amenities actually tends to be a little uninteresting here too, uh, that they don't explain much of the gender differences. Uh, so women do show some stronger preferences for restaurants, specifically it's limited service restaurants. But other than that, we don't see much difference. So this is actually a picture of one of my favorite restaurants in Ohio called North Star Cafe. And it is this type of um, limited service restaurant, a nicer one, uh, where you go and you can order, they have brunch there, you order at the counter and then you sit down a little more cafe-like. Um, but one thing we don't have with this data is quality. Right. So all restaurants are kind of considered restaurants or full service, limited service, but we can't really distinguish quality, which is a limitation for this methodology. Right. Is all restaurant coming into your city the same? Probably not. There may be differences in preferences for the type of restaurant, which we just can't distinguish with our data here. So we just know if it's a restaurant, uh, but we don't know specifically, you know, what type of restaurant is, is it a burger place? Is it, you know, what is it? Um, so one thing that I expected to find that I kind of didn't was the casinos. So we, there's a literature on the economic impact of, uh, you know, casinos and putting these casinos in. And so I kind of expected a gender difference here where honestly, I expected men probably like casinos and women don't. Uh, turns out neither do, <laughs> at least in terms of this quality life valuation. So this was actually pretty interesting to me because you have some economic development agencies uh, in Ohio and throughout the US who put in these casinos hoping for economic development. And the literature said it doesn't happen. And here we're kind of showing it doesn't happen because neither of them particularly like having casinos in this city. Um, now going to Vegas, right? Flying there to see it might be different, but having it in your own city is maybe a little bit different, but there aren't these gender differences that honestly I kind of expected. Public amenities. This is really where the story is. This is where we find some difference. And to be clear, when we find differences between men and women, when we look at amenities, we generally don't find that men love something and women hate it, or women love it and men hate it. We find they either both like it or they both dislike it. The difference is in their strength of preferences. So men and women both like parks but women show slightly stronger preferences for parks. Men and women don't like high crime rates. 
women show more aversion towards violent crime rates, men show more aversion towards nonviolent crime rates. If you look at better air quality, both men and women prefer better air quality, but women show stronger preferences for better air quality than men. If you look at public transportation, both men and women uh, prefer having more public transportation in their cities, but men show stronger preferences for public transportation, uh, also for cultural sites. And so this is really where the story is, which is an interesting story for policymakers because these are the amenities that they can change. We can change how we're investing public funds to address air quality, public transportation, parks, crime rates. And this is where we do find differences. And the interesting policy prescription, I think, is if we invest more money, for example, in uh, goods that say women prefer, uh, it doesn't mean men don't prefer them. It just means their strength of preference for women is even stronger. So if we think about investing in, you know, to address air quality more, to uh, invest more in our public parks, right? And why would we invest more? Well, it could be that we've underfunded them. And it could be that we've underfunded the types of, or prioritized them less, might be another way to say it, that we haven't prioritized the types of amenities that women prefer more because they're underrepresented in our governments and uh, you know, as decision makers making decisions about how we're gonna invest funds in these public amenities. Let's come back to Gadsden. So what's up with Gadsden? So if you look at Gadsden, Right. So we're saying here, like, maybe we can provide some kind of clue to policymakers. Right. What can Gadsden do? So generally, Gadsden is worse than average on most amenities, both the amenities women prefer and the amenities men prefer. They don't have much public transportation. They don't have very good parks. The one exception is crime rates. They do have lower crime rates. So why are women showing such a strong aversion and valuating Gadsden is having such a low quality of life compared to men. So when we first saw these results, so my co-author, uh, Locke Reynolds and I were kind of sitting in his office going, man, what is going on with Gadsden, right? This is an, and maybe this is an outlier. Maybe we're missing something. And so my colleague is kind of Googling things. We're both on our phones in our offices. Uh, you know, what's, you know, what is Gadsden? We've never been there. Like, why is it that women don't like it? And the first thing my colleague says, well, I don't know, it's kind of a blue collar town. There's a manufacturing plant there. It's a Goodyear plant. And I said, stop. I know Gadsden. I know that Goodyear plant. And he kind of looks at me like, how do you know that Goodyear plant in Gadsden? And I knew it because the very piece, the very first legislation that President Obama ever signed was the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. This is Lilly Ledbetter. The Gadsden plant in Alabama, oh, you might be hearing my dog. <laughs> The Gadsden plant in Alabama is Lily Ledbetter's Gadsden plant. She worked there for about 27 years. And upon retirement, someone slipped a note under her door and said, Lily, you have been receiving significantly lower pay for doing the same job basically the entire time you've worked here. She was discriminated against for being a woman. And because of statute of limitations, she basically had no recourse because they said, well, yes, you were severely discriminated against in terms of pay, but it happened over 27 years ago and you didn't say anything 27 years ago. So the first piece of legislation President Obama signed into office was saying, no, you should be able to come forward whenever you find out you've been discriminated against. That was Gadsden, Alabama. So then that got us to thinking. What other amenities aren't we thinking about that women might be thinking about that they prefer about their cities? And this is how we got to gender role attitudes. So what we did is we looked at a recent paper, the Charles et al. Uh, paper that uses the general social survey, which is a survey to try and get attitudes for Americans on a host of things. One of them is gender roles. Uh, so we used uh, information from that paper to estimate gender role attitudes. But we also used a number of historical things for the US. We looked at for each, this, these are state measures. So we looked at for each state, when did they approve suffrage to give women the right to vote? When did they approve the Equal Rights Amendment that would be an amendment to give women equal rights? 
what is the percentage of female state legislators they have. And we also looked at their democratic vote share. So what we did is we looked at these measures separately and we also created, uh, doing factor analysis, we created a progressive gender attitude, which combines all of them together. And so what we see is generally, if you look at men, men either doesn't affect their quality of life at all. So it's not that men are saying, I really want traditional general attitudes in a city. It makes me like the city more. Men either feel the same, don't have any preferences in terms of their quality of life, but it's women who show very, very strong preferences for having, for living in a city, in a state with progressive gender role attitudes. And so this shows up one of the most significant factors that affects the quality of life for women and affects differences in the quality of life valuations between men and women is living in a state that has progressive gender role attitudes. And so what that means is even in a city, so Austin, Texas, is a city in the US known for being pretty liberal, but it is in Texas, which is a state known for being uh, pretty red, pretty Republican, um, not liberal. And so what that means is even in a city like Austin, women will be less likely to evaluate that city as having a high quality of life because you are in this state that doesn't have very progressive gender role attitudes. So when we look at what we've done here. We basically see that men and women have similar valuations. If you look at the size of the city, right, they both prefer larger cities, which makes sense because more people have actually located there, right? So it must mean men and women like that city more. So this is some of what Al Bui showed with his quality of life literature. But women are more affected by the costs of cities that are larger, men less so. So things like air quality, crime, uh, commutes, while women also benefit less from agglomeration. So when we think about the efficiencies of large cities, right, and people locating in larger cities, we need to think about gender because when we think about things like agglomeration, what happens when more people live in a city, they actually affect men and women differently. And so when you look at the importance of quality of life, so this is from Glazier's work that he shows, is that places with higher amenity values do better over time. And so here what he's using is he's taking a regression of housing prices on per capita income, and he's using the residual from that regression as an estimate of amenity value. So I put a little star there. Uh, so my next, I'm see my time. So. My other paper kind of relates a little bit to what Glazier did here in creating this relationship between his estimation of an amenity value using residuals and showing it uh, is associated with higher population growth in cities. Uh, so before we get there, I'm a little bit of a competitive person and I wanted to um, have men and women cities compete and see who wins. So this is like my city edition of Battle of the Sexes. So what I did is using the quality of life valuations of cities in 2000, I wanted to see in terms of population growth, which city did better, the cities preferred by women or the cities preferred by men. So the black line here, so they both started 100, which is basically 100% of their population. So anything above 100 is showing you 5% growth, 10% growth, 15% growth. And so if you look at the cities preferred by women, that black line compared to the cities preferred by men, that gray line, they did better. The cities preferred by women performed better. And part of the reason why I think that is, is because we potentially have an inefficient allocation of investments in amenities. When you have mostly men making the decisions on how to invest uh, public funds into amenities, who maybe have a hard time figuring out what women want, right? Maybe not the most easy thing for a lot of men to do. And so, if you have cities that happen to make more investments in the types of amenities women prefer, they actually did better, potentially a more efficient allocation of those funds. And then we have the pandemic. I feel like we have to talk about a pandemic right now in anything, right? So when we think about recovery from this pandemic induced recession that hit women especially hard. So on the right, you see this picture of a woman, Heidi, who I've actually got to talk to, 
Uh, this is a picture that went viral because this is what her work life looked like for a little bit during the shutdown. She was in a bathtub trying to do work while her you know, youngest there could play in a water table, right? So when we think about recovery from this recession, I think it requires rebuilding our society, amenities, our social infrastructure, our infrastructure, specifically with women in mind. I think this pandemic really highlighted these kind of holes we had in our amenities and our social infrastructure that really affect the quality of life, what makes life nice, what makes a city nice for women. So when we think about how the pandemic changed and highlighted these things for women, another thing it highlighted was that we actually can work from home. Now, granted, we need our kids to be not at home if we're going to work at home, but we're more capable of working at home than we gave ourselves credit for. And so there's estimates that while we see some return to work, we're probably not going to see a return to the way it was before. Some work will remain virtual. And what that means is you could have increasingly so people working in an urban area while living in a rural area. And then this has a question of, well, what about quality of life in rural areas, right? So most of this quality of life literature really focused on large cities. And part of this is really because the data, we have a lot of individual data for large metropolitan areas. We don't have large samples of individual level data that this methodology requires for non-metropolitan areas for rural areas. So really what that means is we know a whole lot less about quality of life and outcomes and data-driven policy for these areas. It means we know a little bit less about place-based policy for these rural areas. So it's not that the previous literature ignored quality of life completely for rural areas, but typically what they did is they take certain amenities and see how that specific amenity affected housing prices, how it affected wages, how it affected population and employment growth. But we don't have, the way you saw me rank those cities, a ranking of rural cities, a ranking of small micropolitan cities. We don't have a quality of life estimate for cities that aren't large metropolitan areas. And that leaves policymakers in rural areas who now have a potential to attract a lot of people who can maybe do more remote work kind of a little bit in the dark about, right, what is the best way for them to, you know, develop their economy? What are economic development strategies for rural areas? So what we did here is we use this quality of life methodology, knowing we don't have individual level data. We have aggregate in the U.S. It's county level data. We know average wages for every county. We know medium home values for every county. So we thought about, this is where the star from that glacier uh, graphic comes from. So we thought about those residuals. So what we did here is we took that housing regression at the county level and a wage regression at the county level for all of the US, and then we saved those residuals. And we're using those housing residuals and wage residuals as a metric, a messy one, to get at quality of life, but also quality of the business environment for every county across the US, rural or not. So if you look at those residuals, the places with high housing residuals, basically places where the housing prices are higher than you would expect given the size of the house, the number of bedrooms, you see places in here like Kauai, Hawaii. This is the Garden Island of Hawaii small, rather undeveloped compared to the other islands. It's beautiful. Uh, you see in Mendocino, California. This is wine country, California. These are no, these are very nice small towns, uh, very nice areas. And so we see this kind of fits. So over on the right hand corner where you have a high housing residual and high wage residual, these are these high productivity places. We kind of think of them as a great place to live and work where the counties before were kind of a great place to live, great place to live and work. You see a lot of places in California, great place to live. A lot of these places have um, big employers. So they have either military bases, some of them have uh, large public institutions, um, but they have typically a large employer. 
So these are all a small towns, so not large towns at all. On the bottom right hand, so these have low housing residual, high wage residual. These are places that are great to work. You see a lot of Texas in there. These are a lot of drilling towns. So they do a lot of drilling, maybe not a great place to live, but a great place to work, high pay typically in these areas. I would say out of all of these kind of quadrants, the one you don't want to be in is the red one. These are places that we would describe as not great to live and not great to work. So Harrison, Arkansas in the South, um, when we saw this again, we we're like, what's up with Harrison, Arkansas? Why is this not a great place to live and work? Um, it is known for uh, being a small town with severe racism and a history of race riots, um, KKK type activity in there. There is severe race issues going on, uh, racism in this town. And you see things pop up that really make these small towns uh, and you can see why, why they're struggling. Oops, went for it. So this is our map of looking at quality of life across the country for every county. So you might see, I should probably circle it. So you, you can see some areas in Texas there along the border. If you look in um, sort of the right, this kind of reddish orangish circle, that's Appalachian, uh, Appalachian area of the country. So this is known for being a, a tough area in terms of economic development, in terms of the outcome for people. Um, and we see kind of this low valuation of quality of life there. That's one of those spots that kind of shows up using these residuals. But generally you see these blue areas, California, right? We get it. People like California and beaches, right? The coasts, I get it. The coasts are gorgeous. I get it, right? We like beaches. And generally we see when we look at these residuals and we look at our quality of life estimation, we generally do see this relationship established in the previous literature that yes, right, when we think about the amenity scale in these small towns, it's associated with higher quality of life. So on the right here, this is a picture of in uh, Teton County, Wyoming. It's beautiful. It's where Yellowstone is. These are, this is a beautiful county. Uh, Wasatch, Utah has a lot of skiing there. Uh, and so we generally see that these are kind of giving us kind of robustness checks on whether we think using residuals actually works. Um, so we think it's messy, but we do think it tends to work. And it works well for counties, we think, where you don't have a lot of data. So the other thing we wanted to look at here is quality of business environment. So where houses are willing to pay higher rents and lower wages if they like an area, if a business likes an area, right? So you remember that billboard, right? If a business really likes an area, they will locate there even though it has higher taxes. If a business really likes an area, they will be willing to pay those higher rents and they will be willing to pay higher wages in order to be in that area. And so we can use those same residuals to get an estimate of kind of the quality of the business environment. And so here the blue areas are an estimated uh, kind of better quality of the business environment and the orange areas are lower quality of business environment. So now what we wanted to look at is what matters more, right? The quality of the business environment or the quality of life for these small towns. And so here, what we're looking at is that population growth is higher in these small towns that have higher quality of life. What about quality of business? No, no, I mean, it's negative, but not statistically significant. Uh, the quality of the business environment isn't associated with population growth. All right, but what about job growth? Even more so, we see here that quality of life is associated with higher job growth in these small towns. All right, what about the quality of business environment? Again, no, no relationship here. The quality of the business environment is not associated with higher employment growth. So when you look at, let me check out my time. I'm going to go forward here. Tables are kind of boring anyway. Uh, so here, basically, what we have is when we're looking at the relationship between neighbors, what we see is that quality of business, high quality business counties compete with other nearby quality business counties, but high quality of life counties, they actually work together. And so when you think about this kind of regionalization here and working together, quality of life counties can really work together. Quality of business counties where they're really focusing on the quality of business, they end up competing with each other, this like taking jobs, a lot of it through the types of economic development policies we see. All right. Uh, and so again, we wanted to look at lots of amenities, what amenities matter. We looked at natural amenities. I'm going to kind of skip over this here. 
public amenities, right? So what made places have higher quality of life? What matter for that population growth, job growth? And we find things like school spending, right? When we think of quality of life, yes, it's restaurants and it's bars and it's cafes and things that make it nice, but it's also having good schools, right? So school spending is a big one that showed up as one of the most significant that mattered for having a high quality of life. So when we think about economic development, right? One, we need to be thinking about quality of life, uh, but we need to be thinking about more broadly in terms of things like school spending, right? School spending is absolutely an economic development policy. Uh, so here we have a measure of physically unhealthy days, basically saying health matters. So in the US, we're kind of known for not having any public health system and that matters, right? Not having access to you know, healthcare for everyone. And connection matters, right? So for these more rural areas, right? Having a connection to that urban area matters. Um, and can you work from home? right? So the percentage of people working from home, if you have a better ability to work from home, things like broadband, it matters for quality of life. And food stores, uh, right? Making sure you have access uh, to things like, you know, grocery stores. All right, I'm going to kind of skip through here a little bit. So here, when we have a large sample of individual data, right? We're not suggesting this is a better methodology. We don't think it is, we think it's messier. But where this methodology helps is when you don't have a large sample of individual data for rural areas, for those small towns. So when you use this kind of aggregate approach to estimating quality of life, it can help fill this gap. And so now we can provide a data-driven data approach that can guide place-based policy for policymakers that are in rural areas. Uh, and so they can think about what types of policies, what types of amenities can help their city's economy. And when we think about both, so when I think about both of these papers kind of mushed together, to me, the underlying string that kind of ties them all together is to really help our economic development professionals have a broader view of economic development policy as not just tax breaks, uh, in terms of where do people and businesses located, what really matters now, uh, at least for the US is quality of life. Can we offer people who are the people, you know, who fill the jobs in these businesses and decide where to locate those businesses? Can we offer a nice quality of life? And what are the types of things that give people higher quality of life from local amenities to things like education and healthcare and I think this data-driven policy can help uh, also provide more representation to people who might feel unheard. So women who are less represented in government, um, we now have data to show what they prefer. I don't always have time to go visit my city council and tell them what I like or don't. I just don't have the time. Other people who don't have kids might have the time, which means they get heard and I don't get heard as much. Uh, without having as many women who are mayors and in those positions, right? They're not representing my preferences as much. But this data-driven approach, I think, is a very democratic way of thinking about these amenities where we can make everyone heard, both women and when we think about people in rural areas, making their preferences and heard. So we're thinking more about, I think about it as kind of thinking inwardly, as what makes my place nice, not outwardly is like, what can I do to help attract a company come locate in my town? And so I think of it as kind of a much broader view of economic de development policy um, in uh, that I hope our economic de development professionals will start to expand their views of kind of economic de development policy. Uh, so I will stop there. Uh, so I will say thank you. And I just wanted to also put the names of the papers there. Thank my co-authors. I think I already mentioned Locke, uh, Locke Reynolds uh, helped me with, or we did together the gender differences in quality of life. And my working paper is with Mike Hicks and Emily Warnell um, towards estimating an aggregate approach to estimating quality of life in micropolitan areas. So I will stop there and leave it open for questions. Hopefully I didn't talk too fast. I know that I'm a fast uh, you, talker. You were perfect, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been impressed because you you have been able to be interesting and enjoyable at the same time. I mean, oh. we very often have 
uh, presentation, which are pretty much interesting and rigorous, but not that enjoyable. This one was enjoyable at the same time. Uh, but this was really a thrash presentation, which for an odd day in Italy was really perfect. Um, so um, uh, let me see whether we have questions. So following uh, our routine, uh, we'll start by asking to our PhD students whether uh, some of them is, oh, there's already a PhD student with a question, who is uh, Takashi. Takashi, please go ahead. Can you hear me? I see your, your right hand. Takashi? Are you there or no? Strange, because he raised, uh, can you let me on? Uh, Sarah, is there something that prevents Takashi uh, from intervening? Uh, I, I don't- They might I, not be able to unmute themselves unless they're uh, a panelist. Sometimes there's that setting. He, he, he should be allowed. Uh, I don't know. Strange. I can't, are you, oh, you can't, uh, trying to solve. So sorry, he's trying to solve. So let us see whether um, we have other questions. Otherwise, I might have a question uh, while we are waiting for other uh, possible uh, questions from the attendees. So I have a question that I have. I will start just to break the ice, Amanda. As, um, about the first part of your presentation, so the paper about uh, male versus uh, female and, and the different mechanism uh, of forming preferences. Um, the question that I have is, is the following. It's, it seems to me there's a sort of implicit assumption that in forming their preferences, uh, male and females are treated in an atomistic way. That is that the preferences of men are not affected by the way in which uh, women make their preferences, vice versa. While if you think it well, this is not really the case. I mean, the extreme example could be that of um, uh, a, a male who likes a place because, because uh, uh, his wife likes it, right? Or the other way around. So it seems to me that there's an intersection or a complementarity, I don't know how to call it, in the way in which the two genders form their preferences. And I'm wondering uh, whether this could enter the kind of analysis that, that you do. Yes, that's a great question. So I didn't present the results here, but in the paper, we actually look, cause we're looking at unmarried men and women. So another thing I should say is it might, the preferences for married men and women might be a little different, but this is how we can kind of know if they're their preferences. But one thing we looked at in the paper is the percentage of unmarried men and women. And this is basically to think about the marriage market. Right. So unmarried men and women might be thinking about, you know, marriage and meeting that certain person. And are they thinking about that in the cities that they like? And what we find generally is that women especially are thinking about marriage and the marriage market. So if they see a city with a higher percentage of single men, they evaluate the city as having a higher quality of life. Interestingly, not the same for men. So oh. men, so women are kind of thinking, at least according to our results, are thinking more about the marriage market and marriage than men are. And so what that also means is it kind of tamps down our results potentially for women because women are liking cities simply because men are there, right? So what that means is then they will also, you know, through having more men there, will like the amenities men like because they're potentially not choosing cities where more women are, just the cities that have amenities that they like. And so it actually kind of puts a, uh, I get you can kind of think of our results for it, especially for women is kind of a lower bound that the results might be more than that, but because they're also locating where more men are thinking about that marriage market. And so we find the marriage market is actually kind of where that comes into play, where their preferences are kind of similar, I guess. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm trying to see whether I'm capable to allow Takashi to talk. Uh, so let me see, here it is. Okay, I think that I, I've allowed Takashi to talk now. Takashi, can you talk now? I, I allow you, I actually allow you to talk. Oh? Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. 
I'm in Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, Got it. Okay, okay. <laughs> good, good, good. Okay, um, maybe a trivial question, but th just for my curiosity, um, can you open slide 28 or uh, nine about... Uh, Um, maybe 28 or sorry, maybe nine, 29. Yeah, the, the bottom one, uh, the gender gap in benefits from agglomeration between women and men. Um, I wonder what uh, the author, how the author explains the mechanism that, um, what, 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 what comes it, what does it come from the, the gender gap in the benefits agglomeration benefits. Yeah, the, the underlying mechanism. So I can't remember off the top of my head the story. I remember how they are measuring it. So they're basically with um, looking at the benefits of from agglomeration, they're looking at uh, kind of what is the wage impact of, you know, locating in a larger city and they find it is larger for men uh, than women. And uh, yeah, I don't remember what their story was behind that. Okay. Hmm. Thank you. Mm. Right. Any any other question from the floor? I mean, uh, if we don't have question from the PhD students, also the other are allowed to. So, if people from our faculty want to intervene or raise question, they are more than welcome, of course. Um, Andro. Yeah. Yeah. Carlo, go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning and thank you for the amazing presentation. I mean, I'm not a fully quantitative um, student, let's say, but uh, I enjoyed you it. You are becoming that, come on. <laughs> <laughs> trying to. <laughs> you are. <laughs> now the jokes aside, the point is, um, this is very interesting. And let's say the, the, the precision that, um, let's say that, that you, applied to analyze the people's um, also perception in a way. And uh, my, my guess, that is not a real question, probably is only a comment, but with the changing of the, the, the way of work uh, after the pandemic, uh, meaning uh, the possibility that a lot of job will become permanently from remote, let's say, uh, wouldn't, in your opinion, the the housing market uh, changes weight uh, in people's behavior and decision making process. I mean, if I can afford, if I know that I'm going to work from home, uh, maybe I would like to to live in a let's say less central place, but uh, with the same uh, wage, I can afford the, a room, uh, uh, an additional room, maybe to have my own workplace, even if I have a family, dogs or uh, or children, like. So this is my wonder. Maybe it would be interesting to repeat such an, an analysis uh, after the, the the real end of the pandemic, seeing you know the new job market. Thank you. I think you're right. I think that's an interesting point because I think you're right. I think on the housing side. Um, so I didn't mention. So we didn't wait them for. So the waiting the waiting is actually a. I mean, you have like an exact number that Albuie gave, but there's some fuzziness in the waiting. Oftentimes we see numbers and we think of them as exact just because we, that's how I think our human brains work, but there's some fuzziness in the waiting. Uh, but I think you're right. I think it's going to change. It could potentially change the weights. And I think it can also change the markets more fundamentally, right? So if you work in Silicon Valley in, you know, San Francisco, but you don't want to live there because it's so expensive, right? Will you be hired and your employer say, well, do I have to pay you that much if you're going to be living in Ohio, but working in Silicon Valley? And so they've said, and there's been companies who have said, no, we wouldn't do that. But right, these are profit maximizing firms, like, wouldn't they? And so I think it could be changing wages and changing the housing market. And, and I think you're right, there's a little more. Uh, so I would say some of our results on the, when we're thinking about rural areas, they didn't work as work as well. They worked okay, but they didn't work as well for metro areas because of this idea about commuting. And so one thing that we wanna do is put in their commute times, right? Because if we think about, you can put what a commute is worth. If you have to travel an hour, take average wages, you know, that's what that's worth. And then that can also, uh, I think will help in especially metropolitan areas, but it gets a little bit about, you know, what you're saying when we're thinking about where you can locate, you could live potentially in a rural area with no commute. 
Uh, and so then you see, and you do see the housing market going crazy right now, uh, where housing markets seem to go up to adjust to people's preferences, but wages feel stickier to me right now. So that's kind of more my sense where we're like, oh, housing prices can go up. But in America, especially right now, we're really complaining about wages going up and they seem to be a little stickier to me than housing prices. Okay, well, thank you very much. All right. Uh, so we have a, a written question, Amanda, from you. I'm gonna read it for you from Tamika. Uh, this is Tamika Campini from Malawi. My question is in relation to productivity and quality of life in rural areas and small cities. Do you have any policy recommendation on how we can improve quality of life and productivity for economic development in these cities, just in case I missed when you were presenting? Yeah, so interestingly, what I find for rural areas is very similar to what I find for women is number one, just have solid public goods and services, right? So that means schools need to be solid, uh, healthcare, and, we, and this I kind of think also is quality of life, right? When we think about quality of life, I do think about restaurants and shopping, but I also think I want childcare for my kids and I want healthcare and that is a better quality of life. And so I find kind of similar to what I find for women is also similar for rural areas is that we first and foremost have to have solid public goods and services um, that gives a broad range of people the ability to live and work there. So I talked about the Silicon Valley, right? So the Silicon Valley worker, right? Who's the you know, computer programmer, maybe potentially would love to live in a rural area, but they're not gonna live in a rural area if they don't have childcare, it, right? It's just not gonna happen. And so in order to get that highly paid Silicon Valley worker, you have to have things like childcare and decent healthcare and grocery stores. And so a lot of it is kind of the basics that, you know, we all think we you know, need in our lives and maybe we have in our lives and don't even think like I'm walking distance to a grocery store. Um, and I don't think about how important that is for me if I you know, lived in a rural area where I didn't have good access to a grocery store or to childcare. And so I find, you know, the policy is pretty similar for both that in both, we need to be thinking about quality of life, not necessarily the businesses, right? It's about us, not the firms, right? Is life good for me here? Not what are the tax rates for those firms? Not, you know, what kind of tax abatements can I do for these firms? But can I create this kind of ecosystem for the people who would potentially work there that they would like to live there? And so the policy prescriptions are really the same kind of that I find for women and for rural areas. Fine, uh, uh, Tamika, in the meantime, also find a way to enable to talk. So if you wanna go over this question, you can, you can do it, Tamika. You are now allowed to talk. Uh, I, I didn't try before, just realized after having read your message. So Tamika, if you want to add something, you, are, you can do it now. Is, is it okay? No, no answer, so it should be okay. Other, other questions from, from the floor? Any other? Um, I have another question, uh, Amanda, about the second uh, part of the presentation. Uh, when you contrast the, say, quality of business and the quality of amenities in driving, say, the performance of places, you, you mainly did in terms of employment growth. Uh, do you have similar results when you look at other, say, indicator of performance of these places? More yeah. economically oriented than, than population growth? Yeah, so we mainly focus on population and employment growth, but the other one we looked at were poverty rates, right? So when you think about economic growth, so one issue all around the world in the US is that economic growth doesn't necessarily mean success for everybody, right? Especially as we've seen inequality growing. So just because a place is doing better and here we might especially be thinking about that Teton, Wyoming, right? That's in Yellowstone, it's gorgeous, the ski town, right? So yes, the indicators for population growth, employment growth might be good, but it could be you have a lot of people, original residents who are left behind by this growth. And so another measure we looked at was poverty rates. What happens to poverty rates? Do we have people increasingly left behind? And what we find is for quality of life, the answer was no, that poverty rates actually were lower uh, in those and decreased, or I should say decreased more in those high quality of life places. And so we see the growth, these kind of you know, nice economic factors of population growth and employment growth didn't mean necessarily that we left people behind in these areas. 
Okay, that, that's very interesting indeed. All right, any other question from the floor? Let me check. I see, oh, I see one hand up. <laughs> no, no question from the floor. Wait, is it Pier Giorgio? I'm, pro I'm sorry if I say your name incorrectly. You say, you say Pier Giorgio with a right hand? No? Oh, hi. Um, Hello. Hi. Yes. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. Uh, I have a, um, a question, a curiosity uh, about uh, the um, competition between uh, female and male. Um, in that slide that you show, uh, which there is a graph, uh, which uh, female are more productive. Can you please show again? Uh, just. Oh, yeah. to, Okay, thank you. So uh, here. Oops. Oh, there we go. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Uh, about this one uh, was um, so female here are uh, cities preferred by uh, women are more productive, right? Correct. Or they have higher, higher population Correct. growth. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, just a curiosity, uh, does the economic sector in this case matter on, on this gap? Uh, just, I'm just wondering if, for instance, if the city is more uh, service related or manufacturing related matters in this case. Uh, yeah, so potentially it could. So here we were just looking at, you know, the cities preferred by women compared to cities preferred by men. And that's it. So we so this is not like a regression that's thinking about, you know, the industries that they're in. Um, and you're right. So when we look at the industries that women tend to be in, things like health and education have done very well uh, in recent decades, where a lot of the industries that men tend to be in uh, manufacturing have not done as well here in the U.S. So, you know, even when you think about Gadsden, Alabama, that city that women really don't like, uh, has that big uh, Goodyear manufacturing plant. So Goodyear does uh, tires. Uh, and, you know, Gadsden has not been doing as well either, and in part because of manufacturing. Um, and I'm not sure that they're even completely unrelated, right? So you have economic development policy in Gadsden, I'm sure, like in Ohio, would say, you know, manufacturing has gone down. So, you know, what tax break can we give to other manufacturing industries to help grow that industry back up here in Gadsden, where I think it's really asking the wrong or kind of mistargeting or mis misfiring kind of, where really the question should be just how do we make Gadsden a better city to live in? Not necessarily what industry should I pick? Um, and so you're right, it doesn't have any industry in there, but I think they're also a little bit related as well. That's a good point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Giorgio. Let me see if I miss some other hands in the meantime. It doesn't seem so. I don't see other raised hands and neither uh, other questions from the attendees. Right? And what about, what about from the YouTube, Adriana? No other question from there? Hello? No. Okay, so, oh no, no question, no question. Oh, okay. Right, uh, I think that we can basically, yeah, think to conclude uh, this, this, this webinar. Uh, again, to me, it was very, very interesting because you actually offered us a, a new lens through which to look at standard issues in local economic development. This is really a new lens that we should definitely get equipped with also in our own studies. And the first part, male versus female, this is uh, something that we should retain more carefully. And the same holds true for the second part of the presentation, uh, urban versus rural areas, uh, business quality and amenity quality. So. You, you, we, we are really grateful to you, Amanda, for having offered uh, this uh, new and original lens of analysis, and uh, which we will try to benefit in our in our future research as well. Having said that, we we thank you very much, and we definitely hope to be able to invite you soon in Laquila in person uh, to show you the quality of amenities 
of Lacular, because I suspect that these are more than the quality of business in, 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 in the city, okay? I would love that. I've seen some pictures from Alessandra, and every time I see a picture, I'm like, oh, I want to go there. So we, we, will, we will do that. We will do that, okay? Okay, uh, so thank you very much, Amanda. Thank you. Uh, to the other attendees, I just um, uh, remind that uh, we are going to have other two webinars, and the next will be uh, on next Wednesday. Uh, if I remember well, it's in the afternoon, but I will get back to you with more precise information. Having said that, I wish to everybody a good continuation of the day. Uh, thank you, Amanda, and hope to see you soon in person. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Great okay. questions. This is okay. fun. Okay. Okay. Bye. 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 Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.